So for today's webinar, we will be joined by Dave Chandrasekharan, a training consultant and certified application counselor. Dave will provide strategies to support consumers in understanding how commercial insurance works, evaluating and, evaluating and comparing marketplace plans, and selecting the plan that best meets their family's needs. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dave to get us started today. Great, thank you, Kyle. Um, I don't know if you wanted to mention the upcoming webinars. So right here, you can see a list of our upcoming webinars. You can register for those on our website at Be Health Reform Beyond the Basics. Dot org. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Dave. Great. Um, Kyle, I'm always happy to be a part of the webinars here that the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities provides for assisters around the country. Uh, I know many of you I probably have had a chance to meet uh, either in person or through webinars. Um, I spent uh, almost five years at the Center on Budget and more recently have been doing independent consultant work, but was very um, fortunate to have the opportunity to once again work with the center on these webinars for plan selection issues um, and really appreciate that opportunity. Um, uh, as some of you might know, I'm also a volunteer certified application counselor in Northern Virginia. And so I do get to do one-on-one -on -one direct enrollment. Um, I find it unbelievably rewarding, but as you probably know, um, can be very, very challenging and difficult at times, uh, especially over the past few years just given how much more difficult it's been for consumers to find affordable coverage and even to enroll. Um, I do it, you know, several weeks uh, a year just during open enrollment. For those of you who do it year round um, and, you know, every day, I just think it's a wonderful service you're doing and I really appreciate it. And, and I'm always very impressed and inspired by the assister community around the country. So I just thank you for the service you're doing for your community. For today's presentation, we're going to have four different sections. In the first section, I'll overview just some elements of plans that are sold in the marketplace and private coverage in general. I know many of you are veterans for years doing enrollment work, and so some of this might be relatively basic. Uh, but part of what I hope to also include is some innovative ways to talk about things about insurance with consumers. So hopefully that can add some new elements um, to what you're learning. Uh, the next section, we'll talk about trends in the plans we're seeing in the marketplace. So the kinds of things that insurance companies are doing um, and how that might affect the options available for consumers. Next, we'll talk about some strategies on how to integrate all of this information into the one-on-one -on -one enrollment process, what kind of questions to ask for consumers, what kind of prep to do for open enrollment to hopefully help streamline and make your enrollment process more efficient with consumers. We'll pause for questions after section three and then we'll come back with the last section where we'll go on to healthcare.gov and we'll actually do some sample family scenarios and go through the plan selection process using actual 2019 plans from three different parts of the country. So let's go ahead and get started. But before we do, I have a quick question to ask you. If you wouldn't mind, right in front of you right now on a piece of paper, please write down on a scale of one to 10, how confident you are in your ability to help consumers in this plan selection process. So how confident are you in your skills, in your uh, opportunities for success, in really helping consumers find the best plan for them? Go ahead and write that down and obviously we'll come back to it later on. So let's get started in the first section around qualified health plans. As you probably know, there are five main elements to any private insurance plan, whether it's sold on the marketplace or something that you might have through your job or something else you might purchase yourself on the individual market. There's the premium, which is the monthly membership fee you have to pay to maintain your coverage. Then there's the plan design, which is the term for all of the different values of the cost sharing, like deductibles, out-of-pocket max, co-pays, and co-insurance. Then there's the list of benefits that are covered. There's the list of drugs that are included and how they're covered. And then there's the network uh, of all the different providers you can go and see. So doctors, health centers, hospitals, pharmacies, et cetera. We're gonna dive into the cost sharing side. So that's where we really hear a lot from consumers. So on your screen, you're gonna see a screenshot of the window shopping page on healthcare.com. So healthcare.gov slash C plans. Um, this actually just changed in format about a week ago. So prior to that, it was a different format. Now it's in a new format. As you know, you'll see your plans uh, premium that'll be in the upper left-hand corner now. And then there's also gonna include information on the deductible there in the middle, along with the out-of-pocket maximum. And then it also includes a list of four different services that are the commonly, uh, most commonly ones seen by consumers. 
So there's the primary care doc, specialist doc, generic drugs, and emergency room care. This format's a little different than how it was before, so I'm gonna have screenshots using this format, but also some from the old format, uh, because this change was very recent. In addition, as you know, you'll be able to click on this button here in the bottom left-hand corner, and that'll take you to the uh, greater information about the plan on healthcare.gov. You'll have the listing here with the different information we just saw. And now, unlike before, where it would automatically list all the different values, you now have different tabs for the coverage. And so it's useful for you to get familiar with that. So there's one tab here for the cost of medical care. And when you click on that tab, it'll open up and show you the things like primary care, specialty care, labs, et cetera. There's also another tab for prescription drugs, and that has the prescription drugs listed separately. So generic drugs and all the others, which we'll get into in a second. It does mean there's a little more steps when using this window shopping tool than before, which uh, I actually think is less helpful, um, but wanted to make sure you're familiar with it. And I encourage you to go online right now and play around with it so you become very familiar with how this is set up before you see your first consumer. The other tool that's very helpful, as you know, is the document called the Summary of Benefits and Coverage, or SBC. It's a PDF document that summarizes all the different information about the plans, and it provides a lot of great detail compared to what's listed on healthcare.gov, talking about the deductible and how it works. And as you go to the next page, it includes all the different co-pays and co-insurance for the various different services a consumer might see, and things like limits or any kind of uh, uh, other information they should know as they're uh, looking at how they would use care. And this document's available for every single plan sold in the marketplace. Uh, you can click through it and find it on healthcare.gov. It's also included for every plan that's not sold on the marketplace, including a plan you might have from your employer. So it is a very useful document, even for yourself, if you're interested in learning how your coverage works. So let's really dive into cost sharing now. And if I was in person with you all uh, right now, if I was um, talking to you about these topics, one of the things I do is I ask the audience to raise their hand if they've ever had a consumer who struggled to understand what a deductible was or what the out-of-pocket maximum means and how they work. And as you can imagine, pretty much everyone raises their hand because these are very complicated terms and concepts and they function very differently than other types of insurance, than auto insurance, than homeowners insurance. And so one of the things we like to do is try to help break that down into easier uh, concepts for them to understand. So in the first few open enrollments, what I would do when there was many consumers who had never had private coverage before, I would sort of take a piece of paper and I would draw on it in hand. And I would say, let's pretend you buy a plan and it has this $2,000 deductible and this $6,000 out of pocket maximum thing. And you're gonna have a certain amount of medical expenses through the year. We don't know how much, but we're gonna have a certain amount. And so at the beginning of the year, whenever you go and receive medical care, you're actually gonna pay the full amount of that medical bill during what we call the deductible phase. And so when you're in the deductible phase, you're paying that bill, whatever comes for whether you go to the hospital or the doctor's office or get any prescriptions filled. Now through the course of the year, if you end up paying out of your own money, $2,000, now you've hit the deductible or you've met the deductible. And so now you're no longer in the deductible phase. After that, you're gonna split the cost of all of your medical bills with the insurance company. You're just gonna pay what we call a copay or a coinsurance the copay is a flat dollar fee, whatever it is, each time you use the service. And the coinsurance is a percentage of the bill. And the insurance company will pick up the rest of the bill. Now, for many people, they may not hit the deductible until later in the year, like November or October. For some, it might happen very early because of some major health crisis early in the year. And for many consumers, they don't hit it at all. And so it's not an issue. If you do hit the deductible and you're paying these copays and coinsurance, you could have a year where you have a lot of medical expenses. And so even those smaller copays and coinsurance could end up costing a lot if you use a lot of care. And in this case, if it's another $4,000, well, plus the $2,000, you've now spent $6,000. And so now you've hit what we call the out-of-pocket maximum. That's a protection for you that caps how much you'd ever have to pay, even if you have a really bad year when it comes to health uses. And from that point on until the end of the year, you don't pay anything. The insurance company picks up the full cost of any care you have. Um, now, for many people, again, they may not hit this out-of-pocket maximum until at the end of the year. Most people don't hit it at all, but it is there to protect people in case they happen to have a major health need. Now, as you can imagine, these are, this is a very oversimplified way of describing these terms, but hopefully it could give a baseline to consumers, especially if they're new to uh, private insurance, to help them so as we go through helping them understand the different elements of healthcare, they'll have 
a, a, a way to sort of compare and balance the things like premium with these other values. So one major thing I want to talk about is what's called first dollar coverage. Now, we just talked about how a consumer has to meet that deductible first before the insurance company kicks in and pays any benefits, before they get to pay just a copay or a coinsurance. But as you probably know, that's not true in all cases. So here's an example of a plan from Green Bay, Wisconsin, which has a deductible of $5,200 a year. And as we just described, there are many services where they'd have to meet that deductible first. And then after they meet that deductible, they just pay a coinsurance or a copay. For example, for x-rays, they pay a 20% coinsurance after they meet that deductible. And same with the preferred brand drugs down below, it's a $50 copay after they meet the deductible. But here for this particular plan, you can see that they list some services where they don't have to worry about the deductible. So on the top for primary care, they just pay a $50 copay right away on day one. They don't have to worry about that deductible. Same with specialty visit and same with the generic drug list. And the reason that's beneficial is for most consumers, they're looking at price mostly. And as you know, they really are concerned about monthly price. So they're gonna look at plans that are cheaper, but those plans tend to have higher deductibles. And if you can find a plan that balances that with some first dollar coverage, then hopefully they're able to get some access to the care they need without having to worry about that big deductible. And so that can add value for the consumer. Now they call it first dollar coverage because as soon as you pay your first dollar in premium, you're getting the insurance company to already pay some of your bills to already kick in and cover some elements and you're just paying the copay or coinsurance. I did want to mention the different ways you might see first dollar coverage described because it might be different on healthcare.gov and different on the health plans website and different on the summary of benefits. And so they might say that this particular service is pre-deductible or that it's exempt from the deductible. It might say that it's not subject to the deductible. It also might say that the deductible doesn't apply to this service, for example, doesn't apply to primary care, or that it's waived for this service, you know, like generic drugs. It also might say that the service copay is before the deductible, so it'll say primary care, $10 copay before the deductible, or it just might not say the words after deductible, like we just saw in the previous example. It'll just say primary care, $50 copay, and so you can presume for the most part that that means the deductible doesn't apply, but if you're not sure, you can always go to the summary of benefits and coverage, and that usually says it definitively. Now, on a related note to issues of H uh, uh, first dollar coverage is something called HSAs. So that's a health savings account, and there are, uh, that's a, a basically a bank account you can open up as a consumer, and you can put money into it that is pre-tax dollars. And you can use that to pay for medical expenses as long as you buy what's an, called an HSA eligible plan. And for the plan to be HSA eligible, it has to have generally a pretty big deductible and it has to have no first dollar coverage. So you have to pay the full amount until you hit the deductible. And you can use that HSA account and that pre-tax dollars to pay for those medical expenses. Now, the problem is most of the consumers we work with don't have a lot of extra money to put into an HSA account or maybe don't know how to do it. And as a result, if they bought this plan, they would just have a plan that has a pretty big deductible but has no first dollar coverage and they're not really getting that tax benefit out of it. And so I always caution about looking at HSA plans for consumers because they tend to be the cheapest on the marketplace, but again, they may not offer the kind of value that meets the needs for consumers. And as you can see, there's a plan on the right that is done by the same company. This is a few years ago from Atlanta, Georgia. It's the same company and it's their non HSA eligible plans. And so it has some first dollar coverage and maybe it might have a slightly lower deductible. But the difference in price, as you can see, is only about $25 a month. So if they were to pay $25 a month more, which is about $300 more per year, they would get to have some first dollar coverage. And if they were to go to the doctor, you know, maybe uh, two times, three times, that probably saves them money if they buy the plan on the right. So it's something to keep in mind as we're helping consumers look at plans. Now, another thing that consumers often bring up is not being sure what how this deductible works. What counts towards the deductible? How do I know if I'm meeting it yet or not? So we'll just take the plan on the right as an example and we'll put it in that structure that I showed before just to convey this. And so as we know, there's certain services that are um, not uh, exempt from the deductible. So you have to meet that deductible first. So in this case, you're in the deductible phase and let's say you're getting some labs and getting some prescriptions filled that are brand name. And in this case, we'll make up some values because we don't know exactly how much they cost. That's dependent on how much they cost when you're in the deductible phase, what you get charged. So I made up some values there, $120 and $200. And when the consumer uses these services, 
they do count towards the calculation of a deductible and they count towards the out-of-pocket max. So it's pretty straightforward. But now let's look at these services that are exempt from the deductible. In this case, if you had a primary care visit and you went and filled some generic drug medications, we know exactly how much you'd be paying because we know what those copay values are from day one without worrying about the deductible. However, those payments do not count towards the deductible. So if the deductible is waived for those services, any copays you pay for it don't count towards meeting that deductible. But they do count towards the out-of-pocket maximum. And the reason this is relevant is because we have heard stories of consumers who buy a plan, they go and use care the next year, and when they, they come in, they say, well, I was told I had this deductible and I paid all this amount, but then they say I haven't even you know, done anything towards the deductible, and it's just a way we can make sure that uh, we can explain to them why that works. Now, I wanted to flag just briefly about metal tiers. Again, if you all are veterans, you know this very, very well already. But just to try to explain it to consumers, you can use something like a, a, a table like this. This is some plans in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so you can kind of mention, well, there's the, the, what we're calling here bronze, silver, gold, and platinum is just about how generous the plan is. So a platinum plan is considered the most generous. It usually has a low deductible, sometimes zero, no deductible, and low copays. But if you want that plan, you're going to pay a lot per month. You can see here the price per month is uh, very high. Conversely, if you want to pay very low per month, you can buy a bronze plan, but then the deductibles are going to be very high. The copays might be higher. There may be little to no first dollar coverage. And then silver or gold are just steps in between. So the question really here is the sort of balancing the notion of do you want to pay a lot per month, but pay lower when you go and get care, or pay very low per month, but whenever you go and get care, you're going to have to pay a lot. And again, for each consumer, it's different, but helping them understand these tiers might help them figure out what's right for them. Now, briefly to talk about cost sharing reductions. Again, for those of you who are veterans, you're very familiar with this, and many of our consumers actually qualify for these plans. And so the plan on the left, as you can see, is the regular silver plan. It's for anyone who's over 250% of poverty. It'll have a premium, a deductible, whatever it is. It's the base silver plan that if a company is selling that. If a consumer makes slightly lower than that, so in this case below 250%, they qualify for a slightly more generous version of a silver plan. Slightly lower deductibles, maybe slightly lower copays. Uh, although we see for many consumers, it ends up being roughly similar to the silver plan that they would have bought otherwise. And so it doesn't um, convey a lot more generous benefits. But if someone is below 200% of federal poverty, they qualify for the one that's called the 87% silver version. And that usually not only is the tax credit bigger because their income's lower, but now they usually have a much lower deductible and lower copays. And then lastly, on the far right is the most generous version of the silver plan. It's for people below 150% of poverty, and it'll have some of the lowest deductibles, perhaps even no deductible, and very low copays. And then it's even better than platinum plans on the market. And so depending on a person's income, they're only going to see this version of the silver based on which income category they are. And as you know, these silver options, especially for the right two uh, categories, they tend to be very um, beneficial plans depending on a consumer's needs. So one thing I did want to mention is we talked a lot about deductibles and what counts towards it and what doesn't, but want to make sure we remind consumers about this one benefit around preventive care. And that's that there's no cost for preventive care for consumers. There's no co-pays, there's no co-insurance, the deductible doesn't apply, it doesn't matter if it's an HSA plan or anything, consumers can get preventive care free of charge. So that could be your annual doctor visit, it could be certain vaccines, it could be certain tests based on your age or gender that are recommended by clinicians. And so in general, for the most part, preventive care is free of charge. And I bring this up because uh, in one of the first open enrollment periods, I was there with another sister and we were helping an older gentleman look at coverage. And his income was a little higher, he had about 300% of poverty or more. And so his tax credit wasn't very big. And so the plans were quite expensive. And so he was looking at bronze plans that were still over $300 for him and his wife. And they had no first dollar coverage, very big deductibles. And it really seemed like he was going to probably decline coverage and walk out without enrolling. And the other sister that was with me just mentioned near the end of the appointment, oh, by the way, I don't know if you know that preventive care services are free. And his eyes kind of perked up and he actually ended up talking to us a lot more about it and understanding how that worked. And he ended up enrolling in coverage. That one aspect ended up being important enough to him and for him and his wife to make him feel like he wanted to go ahead and buy coverage. And so part of this is understanding that we make sure not to assume on any priorities and to make sure we are providing all the information so that the consumers themselves are balancing those priorities and making the decision that's best for them. 
Another thing to flag, um, especially for consumers that are looking at those cheaper bronze plans and the bronze plans have really big deductibles, maybe they have no first dollar coverage. I want to explain the concept of these negotiated rates that carriers do. And so this is a document that's called an explanation of benefits. It's something that you and I might get after you receive care. It's not a bill, it's just sort of a summary of the care you've gotten and sort of how the payments have handled. And so let's say a consumer went and had two different doctor visits and then they also got some labs done. Now the provider is gonna bill the insurance company. They're gonna show you and the insurance company what they would normally bill, which is usually very expensive. And so if you were uninsured, you'd have to be paying this amount. But every insurance company, as you know, contracts with each provider and they negotiate a rate. And so they call that an allowed amount or a negotiated amount or a contracted rate. And so even if you're in the deductible phase and the insurance company isn't paying anything for your care yet, you're still paying that contracted rate, that much lower amount. So if you buy this plan and it happens to have a big deductible and no first dollar coverage, there's still a benefit to you as a consumer. You're sort of getting the bulk purchasing uh, power similar to if you are a member of Costco. And so that's something to flag for consumers if they're struggling with whether or not it's worth buying that coverage. Now moving on a bit to benefits, as you know, um, there's 10 essential health benefit categories that are listed here. And the reason this is really important is before the Affordable Care Act, you might have been working with people finding or looking for insurance. And you probably remember that health plans didn't have to cover all of these categories. So there would be plans who didn't cover mental health or didn't cover maternity care or prescription drugs. And you can imagine how difficult that was, not just for consumers who would buy a plan and then realize later that it didn't cover something they need, but if we were trying to help them look at plans, we couldn't compare them apples to apples because they'd all be different in every way. But thankfully, the Affordable Care Act standardized this aspect of the plans. So all plans pretty much cover the same types of services. Now, there is one example I want to flag, and that is related to the pediatric oral coverage at the bottom. So based on a quirk in the way the Affordable Care Act was implemented, uh, health plans did not have to cover child dental care if there are standalone dental plans available in the market in your area. And for the most part, there are standalone dental plans in most areas. So here are three plans sold in the area where I volunteer. And the plan on the left does not include dental benefits for kids. So if a consumer bought this plan and then also wanted to have dental plan benefits for his kids, they would have to go and purchase a separate standalone dental plan. And that could be anywhere from $10 or $20 or $40 a month. And the tax credit wouldn't help them cover that cost. They'd have to pay that whole thing themselves. Now the plan in the middle does include dental coverage for kids. So if a consumer bought this plan, they would just be paying the monthly premium for the plan and it would include dental benefits for coverage. And then the plan on the right in our area happens to include dental coverage, not just for kids, but also for adults. It's sort of, it's not required by the law, but it's an added perk that they offer. And I know that several consumers in our area, as they were debating between plans, that aspect of it, the adult dental coverage was attractive enough for them to, to choose plans sold by this company. Another thing related to benefits I wanted to flag is that something called other coverage services. And so near the end of the summary of benefits and coverage, there's gonna be a box listed as other covered services. And it'll include a list of the different services that this particular company is including, even though it's not required by the Affordable Care Act. So it can be things like bariatric surgery, infertility treatment, eye exams for adults, hearing tests. And so this might be something useful just to get familiar with at the beginning of open enrollment in case consumers uh, are interested in these services. Now moving on to prescription drugs, as you know, when you're looking at healthcare.gov, every plan is gonna have four different categories of drugs. There's the generic drugs that has the lowest copays. There's a preferred list of brand name drugs that has the slightly higher copays. Then there's all the other brand drugs that are not considered preferred that'll have higher copays. And then lastly, there's the highest category of specialty drugs, which has the highest copays usually. Now I do wanna mention that we're seeing some companies put some generic drugs up into that second level or even drop some preferred drugs down into that first level. And so we recommend that you really consider these as tier one through tier four or level one through level four. And in fact, many companies will describe them in the tiering nomenclature. Another thing that's related to prescription drugs is the fact that there might be a separate prescription drug deductible. So for any time you're going to uh, fill prescriptions, you would have to meet this deductible first and then you'd pay a copay or coinsurance if that's how it works. Um, for some consumers, that could be beneficial because it could be that maybe they have mostly prescription coverage, and so they're going to meet that sooner instead of having to meet a bigger deductible, let's say a $2,000 deductible for their medical services. 
However, many plans will actually combine the deductibles into one. So it'll just be one deductible for prescriptions, for medications, for doctor visits, for hospitals. All of that will count towards one deductible. And if that's the case, then on this row here on healthcare.gov, it'll say included in plan deductible. For most consumers, though, the most important thing is if they have a prescription drug, how is it covered and what do they have to pay to get it? And so there'll, there'll be a link here where you can click on it and it'll take you to the insurance company's website. And some plans like the one on the left might have a website that you can actually type in the name of the drug and it'll search it online. And then for other plans like the plan on the right, they might have a PDF format that you'd have to look in. And in fact, it can be quite difficult to scroll through, um, but you'll see here this particular example, the plan on the left covers this drug Humalog at tier two, the plan on the right covers it at tier four. And that way you can help compare that for the consumer. Now, moving on briefly to networks, as you know, every different uh, plan sold in the marketplace will have a type of network. It'll be an HMO or a PPO or a POS. And there's a lot of differences related to that, but some of it really isn't as relevant. And what's really important to help describe to the consumers is this concept of networks that every plan in the marketplace is gonna have a given network of providers, doctors, hospitals, health centers, pharmacies, et cetera. And so each will have different kinds. And then there might be other providers in the area that are not in network. They're not contracted with these plans. So we call them out of network doctors. So for an HMO, in general, you'll have to have a PCP you select and that'll sort of be your gatekeeper. You'll go to them first for any care and you'll pay a copay depending on what it is. And then if you need a referral, they'll give you that referral or they'll give you that prescription and you can go get your prescriptions filled. Now, if you go to any out of network doctor, there's no coverage for that. So you're gonna pay the full cost of whatever that is and usually it's quite costly, it's whatever they charge. In contrast for the PPOs, you generally don't have to have any primary care doctor or gatekeeper. You can just go to whichever provider you want. And if you happen to go to an out-of-network provider, there is some coverage for it, although they were reimbursed for less. So those copays and co-insurance will be a lot higher. And that'll have a separate deductible that'll be a lot higher. But if a consumer has a particular health need where they need to go out of network, or maybe they travel a lot, or they need to see a specialist or a special facility that's somewhere outside their state, this might be beneficial for them. But these plans are much more expensive in general. And then more recently, we're seeing a different model called an EPO. It's called an exclusive provider organization. And it's sort of a hybrid of the two we just talked about. There's no gatekeeper, no, no health, uh, primary care doctor you have to go to, um, but you cannot go out of network for any coverage. And so the EPOs and HMOs tend to be the cheaper versions on the marketplace. Again, PPO and point of service tend to be more expensive. A lot of people tend to think that PPOs also have more doctors in network, and that often is true, but not always. So here's an example of some plans sold in Nebraska several years ago. And so I actually just looked up how many primary care doctors are available within a 10 mile radius of a given zip code for all of these different plans that are available. And you can see the Blue Cross PPOs, which has out of network coverage, doesn't actually have the biggest in network coverage. It has fewer doctors than say the United plan at the bottom, which is an HMO. And then the Coventry plans, they actually have four different types of networks. So they have four different plans that they sell. Three are HMOs, one is point of service. And the point of service actually has less doctors. Um, and, but, and so the way they structure this is really these four networks are based on four different uh, hospital systems that they contract with. And so it is important for someone to understand not just the out of network issue of PPR or HMO, but also how many doctors are in network. And that might matter to some people based on if they need to see a lot of providers, if they need second opinions for something, that kind of thing. But again, much like prescription drugs, for most consumers, what really matters is if they have a provider already, is that provider covered in the network? And if, if so, how? So here there's on the healthcare.gov site, when you're looking, there'll be a link to the provider directory and you can click on it. And that'll take you to the insurance company's website and you can go ahead, type in the name of the provider. And of course we can see if they're in network or not. So now that we have the basic elements of plans, wanna move on to different trends we're seeing in the marketplace so you can be aware of them and how that impacts what consumers are able to uh, compare and purchase. Now we talked earlier about first dollar coverage, which I always emphasize is a pretty important thing that could be of great value for consumers. But more recently what we're seeing is a lot more plans that are doing partial exemptions. So instead of saying all of primary care is exempt from the deductible, they're saying, well, you can have three visits exempt from the deductible and just pay this $25 copay. But after that, you're in the deductible phase. So you gotta pay the full amount of whatever that care is. And then once you hit the deductible, then you pay a 35% co-insurance. And so this is useful because even though if a consumer is looking at cheaper plans that are bronze, big deductible, um, at least if you can find a plan with some exemptions for a few visits, that might be useful for them. That might be enough to meet their needs and be of value for them. 
so that they're able to meet some of their healthcare needs without having to pay too much to get a plan that has more first dollar coverage. I just want to show you how this is going to look on healthcare.gov. Now I want to caution that these are the old screenshots of the window shopping site, but the process is still the same from what I checked. And so it'll show here primary care, the copay is $25 slash 35% coinsurance after deductible. But you'll notice it doesn't mention how many visits you get for that $25. And so to find that, you can click here on this link on the bottom left-hand side under the primary care doc visit in the row. And that'll bring up a pop-up and it'll mention how many visits are pre-deductible. In this case, three. It could be one, it could be five, it could be whatever the plan decides to offer. Now, if you don't find this easily here on the website, you of course can click on the summary of benefits from the previous slide and that usually has it very clear. Another thing we're seeing in the opposite direction is plans that have really big deductibles that essentially meet the out-of-pocket maximum. So once you hit the deductible, you've met the out-of-pocket maximum. And that's why they show here that all the different copays and coinsurance is no charge. Because once you've hit the deductible, you've hit the out-of-pocket max, the insurance company covers any expenses for the rest of the year. So this really functions like a catastrophic plan, sort of like how auto insurance works or home insurance works. And for some consumers that might be okay if they are relatively healthy or young and they're just buying a plan just in case something major happens. But for any consumer that has ongoing health needs, this could really put a lot of the burden on them if when they're getting care and so may not be the right fit for them. But again, these are probably the cheaper market, uh, plans on the marketplace and so something just to keep in mind. Another thing is we talked earlier about the four different categories of prescription drugs. Well, it turns out that some plans are actually adding tiers. They're taking that lowest generic tier and they're splitting it into a preferred and non-preferred tier. Or they're taking even that specialty tier up top and they're splitting that into two different tiers. So instead of four different tiers of drugs, some plans might have up to six tiers. And the reason that's relevant is because if you're looking at two tiers, uh, two different plans for a consumer, and you're looking up a prescription for them, both plans might cover that uh, prescription at say tier three. But that tier three is gonna mean something different for each plan, and so it's obviously important for us to find out what that actual copay is for each drug and list that to the consumer when they're comparing those plans. Now, another thing I wanna mention is around the network sizes is in the first couple years of the Affordable Care Act exchanges, we saw that many plans were selling, uh, many companies were selling plans that had smaller networks or what we call narrow networks. And so they might be selling plans outside of the marketplace that have really big networks. That's what they sell to large companies or whoever else. But in the exchanges, they were selling plans that had narrow networks because that was one way to control costs so that they could charge less for the plan so that they could try to attract consumers. More recently, we're seeing some plans slice their networks into different tiers. So you have a tier one that's lower copay, and then if you go to a tier two or tier three, you, the consumer, would have to pay a higher copay. And I wanna show some examples of how that actually impacts the consumer. So here's an example of a plan sold in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where if you go to a tier one primary care doctor, it's a $30 copay. And if you go to a tier two or tier three, you pay slightly higher copays. But you can really see the impact on this example here if, if you have an outpatient surgery or procedure. So in this case, a tier one provider is $250 copay and it's not subject to the deductible. But you can see for tier two or tier three, not only is the copay much bigger, it now is subject to the deductible. So that means a consumer could be paying thousands of dollars more for the same exact procedure, just depending on which tier of provider they're going to. So again, if we're helping a consumer and it turns out that there's a plan that has tiers that they're looking at, we need to look up not just as the provider and network yes or no, but what tier are they in. Now, another thing I wanna flag is around how accurate these provider directories are. And this is a study done several years ago by a really good friend of mine, Claire McAndrew from Families USA, where they just cold called different providers on the uh, directories listed for the different companies in certain areas. And they found here, at least for mental health providers, you can see that less than half or less than one third or less than 20% of providers were actually there and answered the phone at the number that was listed for them on the directory. It could have been that the provider stopped taking that plan. It could have been that they retired. It could have been that they moved to a new area. It could have even been that some of them passed away and they had never updated that directory for years. And so I always mention that if you're with a consumer and they're deciding between a couple plans and their decision is gonna be largely based on which plan includes their provider, I recommend that we actually call the insurance company and call the provider and try to get confirmation of that. And I would even say, ask for the name of the person you talked to on the phone because sometimes they are incorrect and they make mistakes. And so if a consumer comes back or if they have an issue, then they can at least challenge 
uh, let's say a bill comes to them for the full cost because they say the provider is not a network, they can challenge that and say it was based on their information and hopefully at least get that bill fixed, even if it means they might have to switch doctors moving forward. Another thing I want to briefly flag is, this is from two years ago, but we know the trend has continued, is that there's huge swaths of the country where the counties only have one carrier because a lot of insurance companies have left the marketplace. And so that means for those counties and for some whole states, there isn't competition, which can certainly be tough, and there isn't as many options to choose from. Now, for some states, there are decent options and coverage, but we hope that over time, more carriers will come back to add some more options in the marketplace. Now, I want to touch on a few things related to the different changes that has happened under the current administration. Now, one of the things you might have heard of over the past couple of years is that the administration stopped reimbursing insurance companies for those cost-sharing reduction plans, those CSR plans. Essentially, uh, because those CSR plans are more generous, but they charge the same amount as regular silver, that difference in how much it costs for the insurance company was reimbursed by the federal government. And when they stopped reimbursing, the plans had to figure out how to deal with that loss, how to deal with that um, negative deficit for the, what they were selling. And so often what they did was they basically jacked up the prices of all silver plans. And so we call that silver loading. And that's true in most states, that's what they did. And so what that means is actually the silver plans are much higher than they would have been otherwise. And you can see here, some of the silver plans are even more expensive than gold. And so we're actually used to people rarely buying gold just based on their income and what they qualify for. But now it could be of a consumer that has slightly more income who might actually be better off buying a gold plan because it has lower deductibles than a silver plan. Now, the one benefit of the silver plan is that it does, since all silver plans went up and since tax credits are based on the silver plan, it actually means many people's tax credits have jumped up as well. So their purchasing power is a little better especially for bronze, where you'll see a lot of bronze plans are free, and even for gold sometimes. But it means if you don't get any tax credit, you're now faced with a market that has really high prices in the silver and other ranges. Now, some other things that happened, as you know, that a couple years ago, Congress eliminated the penalty for not having coverage, the individual mandate penalty. So now there's less pressure on uh, younger people or healthier people who otherwise would have bought coverage. Now they can go without it and not fear the penalty. And so that actually changes the risk pool of the plans in the marketplace, and so that has definitely impacted costs from year to year in terms of what the premiums are. Another thing that might do the same thing to premiums is the expansion of these plans that the administration is uh, uh, allowing that we consider substandard. So short-term plans or association health plans, uh, they don't have to meet all of the requirements of the Affordable Care Act plan. So they don't have to cover all 10 benefits. They don't have to cover pre-existing conditions necessarily. They don't have to use the rating requirements based on certain protections of the Affordable Care Act. So they can charge less, but they don't cover as much. And for consumers who are just worried about buying a, a cheap plan, they might think that these plans are good for them and not understand that they don't have all the coverage guarantees that the Affordable Care Act plans have. So how is this gonna impact rates for next year? Now, interestingly enough, some reports have come out saying that rates for 2020 might actually not be as high as we think. They might not go up as much as they have in previous years. And that might be a good thing, although one of the reasons that researchers think is because there was a dramatic increase in prices from 2017 to 2018 when the mandate went away and when other things were done by the administration. But they think when the plans were preparing for that, they actually overestimated. And so they charged too much for 2018 and 2019. And so now they're sort of stabilizing by not going up as much. And in some places, the rates might even come down. But we won't know that until the plans are released in your state, which might be in the next week or so, and certainly will be by November 1 when open enrollment opens. The other thing I wanna mention is more recently, the administration has allowed what we call enhanced direct enrollment. So in general, we have a you know, family that's looking for coverage. They'll go to healthcare.gov, uh, or they might come to us and we can help them through healthcare.gov, and we can help them enroll into a plan. Pretty straightforward. They also had the opportunity to go to web brokers, which are online websites that are used by brokers that can also help them look at different plans. But in general, the data was transferred through healthcare.gov or the person would actually be directed to healthcare.gov. Now, more recently, what they're saying is actually these brokers can directly enroll them into the plans, bypassing healthcare.gov altogether. Now that might be okay, and maybe there are processes that consumers can be served just as fine with web brokers, but there are some things we're concerned about. So for example, here's a web broker example called eHealth. And you can see here, they show the Affordable Care Act plans and they show them also with the tax credit. And so they're able to show most of the information in the same way that healthcare.gov might. But they also show these other plans, short-term health plans. 
And you can see here, they're saying short-term health plans are $82 a month starting from, whereas ACA plans are starting from $324 a month. So you can imagine for consumers who are just concerned about price, that might attract them to these short-term health plans, but they may not understand how they're different. They may not understand how they don't cover as much. And that could really be confusing or even cause problems for consumers if they enroll in that plan. So just wanted to mention that in case you see consumers coming in with questions about that. Now, of course, as most of you know, the current administration has really gutted the funding for the navigator programs around the country in the FFM states. And they did the major reductions more recently, and now they're saying they're going to keep that funding flat for this coming year and for the year before, uh, coming up after that. And so we know many of your programs have, in fact, been reduced. You've had to lower staffing or you've had to shorten what you can do. And we know that's really impacted access for consumers. Uh, but one of the things I want to discuss, though, basically in this next section is, what kind of things can we do to try to help us become more efficient in the plan selection process? So hopefully we can perhaps shorten appointment time so we can see more people uh, in less amount of time. So the first thing I want to mention is preparing for open enrollment, some things you can do as soon as the plans come out, even before you see the first consumer. And one of the things is we know most consumers that come to us, if they're lower income and they qualify for CSR, they're generally going to look at silver plans. So here's plans in the area I volunteer, which I just pulled up for a 29 year old who doesn't get tax credit just to look at how they're uh, ranked. And you can see in 2017, you can see that the cheapest plans were sold by this company, Innovation. And in 2018, that company actually left the marketplace here. And so now Kaiser, which had been the most expensive in 2017, now came in with plan prices that were cheaper. Um, you will notice though, the massive price increase I talked about from 2017 to 2018. Now from 18 to 19, you can see that Cigna actually dropped down and became the two cheaper plans and Kaiser was still in that range, but not quite as cheap. And so every year it's going to shift. And so when 2020 comes, uh, you'll be able to organize those plans and just get familiar, especially with the cheaper four, but certainly with all the silver plans in your area, because those are the ones that many of our consumers look at. Now, I also think it's important to prep for bronze plans because we are seeing a lot of consumers just struggle with affording plans. And actually, if they get a big tax credit, some of these bronze plans are free. And so one of the things I say is you can make a table like this. Just look up all the bronze plans. And here's every bronze plan sold in Travis County, Texas. And you can see here, one of the things I do is just mark out where is that first dollar coverage? Because with a bronze plan, it'll have a big deductible. But if we can find a plan that has first dollar coverage for someone, maybe that's something that's a value for them to pay a little more to get. So here you can see the first plan that has first dollar coverage is that and better plan, but it's just for tier one drugs. And the first plan that has uh, first dollar coverage for primary care and specialty care is the plan right below it for ideal care. So this is something you can do just as a guide to become familiar with it so that when you're looking at plans with the consumer, you kind of understand where that thing might, where first dollar coverage might be in case that's something that's important to that consumer. Now, another thing is really understanding the differences in provider networks if you happen to have multiple networks in your area. So I did something as I showed before, I took a five mile radius from a zip code and I looked up all the providers that in this case were either primary care doctors or cardiologists or OBGYN, pediatricians, hospitals. You can also look up uh, um, dermatologists, uh, endocrinologists, cardiovascular surgeons, whatever might be useful for the consumers in your area. And if you're in a rural area, you can maybe expand that to a 25 mile radius. And this is just something you can maybe make as a cheat sheet and just have on your desk in case the consumer asks about like how big are the networks, how, how many doctors are in each of these companies. Another cheat sheet you could make is about those other covered services I mentioned. So in this case, you can see the different lists of services that are available that are not required by the Affordable Care Act, but each company might offer them anyway. So this is an example from a few years ago from the companies in the area I volunteer, where you can see they're all different in what they offer. Now for most consumers, these services are not as important. They're not commonly seen, but for consumers who are looking for one of these, let's say bariatric surgery or infertility treatment, that tends to be a really important aspect of their care needs. And so they might really need to know which pl plan covers these. So if you wanna put a table like this, a cheat sheet like this, you can do it on the back of the one we just showed before and just have that on your desk in case it's ever uh, needed for a consumer. So now let's move on to see how do we tailor all these searches when we're sitting with the consumer, what can we do with them to kind of uh, make our process more efficient and effective, but also uh, more successful. So the first thing in structuring your appointment and how you're gonna approach that consumer is just wondering, are they a renewal or a new applicant? So if they're a renewal, then you know that they had health insurance last year or recently. And so you can ask them about their plan, what their experience was. Did they find that it met their need? Did it have the doctors they need? How did they handle the deductible? Were the copays okay? Did they have confusion about what happened? 
Do they want to keep the same plan or do they want to see how it changed or maybe some new plan options? Now, if they're a new applicant, chances are you're going to have to really start from a base, uh, a lower base of knowledge, especially if they're new to private insurance. So explaining what a deductible is and how it works, explaining co-pays and co-insurance and networks, et cetera. So chances are that process is going to take a lot longer. And in fact, just as a new applicant probably takes longer on the application side, it also takes longer on the plan selection side. So that might need to be a longer appointment, an hour, an hour and a half or longer. But the renewal might be quicker. And I actually recommend with a renewal, if their income hasn't changed by a lot, and if they haven't changed anything else in their family circumstances, that you actually go to the window shopping first and look up how their plans have changed in their area and see if you can get an idea of which plan they might want. And then go back quickly, do the tax credit update, and it'll show you what the final options are. The prices might be slightly different, but I think that process works more smoothly because they've already have everything in the system for their application. And what they're really looking for is the health plan. Now, another thing, of course, as we've highlighted many times, is that if a consumer has any prescription drugs or any doctors that they care about, that'll really be influential in the search. And so making sure we're prioritizing that search. But I do want to mention, though, is that if you ask someone if they have prescriptions or have doctors, they might say no because they don't have any. But that doesn't mean they don't have health needs. Maybe they have a surgery they've been putting off for years and now they're finally going to get it. Or maybe they had a new injury or a new condition that they haven't started seeing anyone yet, but they're going to start seeing once they get coverage next year. And so we really need to ask about their health needs. You know, what kind of health conditions do you have? Do you, what kind of things do you think you might try to go and, and get taken care of next year? So that we're getting the full picture and we can incorporate that as we're comparing the plans. Now, as I've mentioned many times, first dollar coverage is something that often is important for consumers, especially since they're balancing premium versus what other things that the plan offers. And so here is the old way the plans are shown in the window uh, shopping uh, website, but it is relatively similar now in the new, in new uh, version. And so you're going to have an area where that's going to show not just the premium and deductible, but also the summary area of the four different plan, uh, services that are more commonly seen. So you can see here the plan on top doesn't have any first dollar coverage. The plan below has some for generic drugs and it looks like some visits for primary care. And as you're scrolling down, you might find plans that have more first dollar coverage like these two. And you can keep scrolling down to find more plans and see if there is more options for first dollar coverage. But I do, as you're doing that, the prices are going up in terms of the premium. And so I often mention to people that as you're scrolling down with consumers, think of it as if there's a spring attached to it or a rubber band. And as you're scrolling down, it's getting more and more tense. And there's a point after which you can't scroll down anymore because that's sort of the upper limit of what a consumer feels they can pay. So you're kind of balancing scrolling down to find more benefits, whether it's first dollar coverage or other things, doctors in network, anything else, lower deductible. But as you're scrolling down, there's going to be a point where you're going to have to stop because of that tension, because of what they feel they can afford. So you're finding that ideal place for them on their comfort level of getting what they want, they think they need in a plan with how much they can afford per month. So let's understand these trade-offs because it really is all about trade-offs. Now, now one that you'll see often is this trade-off between bronze plans versus silver plans. Cheap bronze that has a uh, you know, high deductible, maybe no first dollar coverage, and a silver plan that's more expensive but has a lower deductible and maybe some first dollar coverage. Now you can see here the price difference is about $47 a month. So you can ask them, so here's this other plan that's silver, it has you know, some of these benefits, do you think it's worth it to you to pay $47 more per month? Do you understand what that would get you? Can you afford that? Every consumer is going to be different, but hopefully through the process of prompting that will help them figure out what's best for them. Now, similarly, of course, you might have the same situation where you have two different plans, one cheaper, one more expensive, and they might actually have one where the cheapest plan doesn't have their doctor and network and the more expensive one does. So in this example, it's about $42 more expensive for that person to get a plan that will maintain access to their provider. Now, for some people that might be okay, other people might say, you know what, I, don't, I can change providers, I'd rather save money. But what we've seen in some focus groups is some consumers will say, yeah, $40 is fine, $50 is fine, $100 more is fine, even $150 more per month in a plan is fine to maintain access to that provider. So making sure we can ask that question in the right way can help us make sure the consumer is weighing those different things appropriately. Now, another thing we've heard of from some focus groups is that you might see a consumer that just wants to buy the cheapest plan on the market. Doesn't matter. Cheap bronze plan, high deductible. In this case, it looks like a plan that has nothing first dollar. So it might be one of those deductible only plans. And that's okay. Even if they have health needs, they might think that's okay because they'll say, you know what, I can go to this free clinic around the corner and, and just pay cash. Or I can get some drug discount cards that lets me go to Walmart or Target and, and just get discounted pharmacy uh, benefits for like $13. Or they might say, I have family that live abroad. 
and I go visit them once a year and actually I can just go pay cash and get all my regular care done there. And I'll just have this bronze plan sort of for accidents or in case something major happened. And while that might be risky for some consumers, if that's what they think is best, we can help them understand that and understand the trade-offs there. And so that really comes down to this last trade-off, especially now that prices are going up and there's no individual mandate penalty. They might really think, well, I can buy this bronze plan or I can just go uninsured. And so for us, that's important to mention the fact that, well, if you have a plan, at least you get preventive services are free of charge. Also, remember, you get this negotiated rate. Instead of paying full cost in case you have some healthcare issue, you just pay this contracted rate, which is usually much cheaper. And then it really comes down to risk because that's what insurance is. It just covers you for risk. And it could be for a major health diagnosis like cancer or a major accident might happen. And if you don't have insurance, those bills are they're tens of thousands of dollars. They're hundreds of thousands of dollars. And as we know, half of all bankruptcies is from medical expenses. And so this is partly there to help cover you in case of an emergency. And so how much is it worth for you to cover that risk? You know, are you willing to spend this much for it? Or do you feel like you're willing to take a chance? Every consumer is different and it's not our place to force a consumer to buy coverage, but certainly to help them understand what the trade-offs are if they buy or don't buy. So with that, I'm gonna pause and turn it over to Kyle and see if we have any questions. Thank you, Dave. So if anyone has questions at this point, feel free to pull up the Q&A box on your webinar toolbar and type those questions in. And we do have a few questions in right now. So Dave, for dental coverage, does that need to be renewed every year like medical coverage does? It does. So it's a regular health plan every year. And so same with the other plans, there may be auto renewal processes. If you want to cancel, you need to cancel. If you want to switch, you have to go in and switch. Um, and so it is something you need to maintain payment for. Um, there was a situation in the past early on where if you had dental coverage, but you decided you didn't want it anymore and you stopped paying your premium, it might've terminated your medical plan as well. I'm not sure if they fixed that or not, but so one of the things I'd see is if you do buy a standalone dental plan, make sure you're talking to the exchange just to understand how it works and how it impacts your medical plan, just to make sure it doesn't do anything inappropriate in that way. So earlier, Dave, you talked about tiered provider networks. Could you explain a little more what tier one through three doctors means and how people can know which tier a doctor is in? Sure. So um, some plans might have this tiering of networks. Many don't, but some might have two tiers. Some might have three tiers. And so all that will mean, and they might only have tiers for hospitals. They might only have tiers for, for uh, provi healthcare providers, for doctors. They might have it for pharmacies. So if that's the case, then they are structuring a copay structure that's different based on the tiering. Cheaper copays for their tier one preferred docs because maybe they might negotiate with a particular doctor group or a health system and say, we're going to put you in tier one, give us a cheaper rate. And so they can charge you a cheaper copay. And there might be, you know, certain hospitals in the area that charge a lot of money in the contracted rate. And so they say, fine, we'll keep them in network, but we're going to pass more of that cost onto the consumer with a higher copay or a higher coinsurance. And the way to find that out, the first way to find that out is the tiering will be listed. It might be listed in the healthcare.gov, but it often will be listed in the summary of benefits. When you click over there, like the screenshot I showed, it'll show you there's tiering. And then when you're searching on the insurance company's website, when the doctor's in network, it should list, are they tiered or not? Tier one, tier two, or tier three. It doesn't always, and that can be very frustrating, but I do, um, you can, at worst case scenario, you can call the insurance company to try to find out what tier is this provider in. All right, that's all the questions we have for now, Dave. You can move on to the next part. Great. So now let's move on to our last section, which is going to be a live demonstration on healthcare.gov um, of a few family scenarios from a few places around the state. So the way we're gonna do it is uh, here, we're gonna have the first example, which is a 32 year old woman from Austin, Texas, who makes um, $30,000 a year. Um, and so let's actually, we're gonna um, ask her about her health conditions. So does she have any doctors? Does she have any prescriptions? What's important to her? Maybe she says, I'm pretty healthy. I just want to get low cost coverage, whatever. I'm just covering it just in case. Many consumers might come in this way. And so it's important for us to navigate that process. So we're going to go on to the healthcare.gov uh, website here. And this is a screenshot of it, but now we'll move over to the browser. And we're going to go ahead and type in her zip code. And we're going to put in the information to find inf uh, what plans are available for her. So we're gonna put in her income uh, and age information. And we see that she seems like she likely qualifies for $185 per month. So let's go ahead and see what kind of plans she uh, has available to her. 
So you can see here the cheapest bronze plan is not that cheap. It's $105. It's a bronze EPO. It has a really big deductible. And uh, we can click on the plan details here. So we can see the deductible actually equals the out-of-pocket maximum. And so when we click here on the cost for medical care, it'll pull up how much is available for primary care, for labs, et cetera. We can also scroll down and see how prescription drugs are covered. And once again, we're seeing here no charge after deductible. So this looks like one of those deductible only plans. So we can talk to her and see if that's one of the plans she wants to consider, because I often recommend that it's worth comparing you know, two to four plan options for, the, for each consumer. Now, maybe she says, okay, I wanna consider this one, because many consumers will often compare any options you suggest them looking at with the cheapest option available. So let's say she considers this one. Now let's see if we can find some option with first dollar coverage, just to compare and show her what the pros and cons are. Now the next plan is a $4,500 deductible and it looks like it has no first dollar coverage when we're looking in this row here in the middle. So we can keep scrolling. This plan also doesn't have any and I'm just gonna keep scrolling until we see first dollar coverage. And so here we have one that's $149 it has a very big deductible and it looks like it's a deductible only plan except it allows generic drugs for $20, no deductible. But if we scroll down one more, we can see here's another one that has actually primary care and specialty doctors, no deductible. So maybe this one might be one worth considering. So we can include that in the comparison. But maybe now she sees, well, these deductibles are huge and she doesn't think she'll have any health needs, but maybe in the course of talking to us, she understands that that's risky. So we just mentioned, well, we can look at some silver plans because they might have some lower deductibles. And so we go on to silver plans and we see here actually the cheapest silver plan is $212. But it has a pretty big deductible. And so we can just scroll down. It does have a lot exempt from the deductible, but let's just scroll down and see, are there any plan options with lower deductible? These might be options she wants to consider. But finally, we find one that has a deductible of $3,000. Now it's an HSA plan, so that means no first dollar coverage. So maybe we say, well, is there a one with lower deductible and has some first dollar coverage? We keep scrolling down. Here's one that's 4,400, and then here we see one that's 3,000. And so here we have a $3,000 uh, deductible. It's certainly more expensive, but it also has specialist primary care and generics exempt from the deductible. So if that's something that's important to her, and I actually checked that it also has tier two drugs uh, uh, exempt. So maybe this is one she's also open to comparing. So we can click here. If we wanna look at more, we can look at more, but now we have three plans side by side. Difference in price, difference in deductibles, and in copays. Now for our purpose, just to have it be more easier to look at, we actually just, we use um, this thing called the Marketplace Plan Comparison Worksheet, something we developed several years ago when I was at the Center on Budget, which allows you to sort of put in this information in a user-friendly way. It's easier to see side by side. Um, now it, it does, isn't something that pre-populates, so you will have to either type it in on a PDF or have to write it in. And that's certainly cumbersome. But what I found is when doing that with consumers, it actually is a great teachable moment because we write down, well, here's the deductible. Here's the primary care doc and it doesn't have to worry about the deductible. Here's the brand name drug and you actually do have to worry about the deductible. And so it helps explain to each consumer how these plans work. Now for ours, I'm gonna use this uh, simplified um, slides. And here we can see the three different plans next to each other. The cheaper bronze plan that's $105, but nothing exempt, big deductible. The other bronze plan with the same deductible that's a little more expensive, but has primary care and specialty exempt and then a much more expensive silver plan with a lower deductible and even more things exempt. And now, you know, maybe she's looking at this and she knows which plan seems best for her. Um, maybe she wants to take some more time and so she can take that sheet home and think about it more. Or maybe she's really confused and overwhelmed and she just doesn't know what to do and, and she turns to you and she says, well, just you pick the plan for me. And as you all know, we have very strict requirements where we cannot pick a plan for someone. We cannot recommend a plan to someone. We cannot say which plan we would buy. We can't say which plan we'd suggest for our parents. But even though those restrictions are in place and we have to abide by them, there are a lot we can do to really help the consumer uh, understand what plan is best for them. So we should in fact dive in. For example, if she says, you know what, I just can't spend more than $200 a month, we can say, okay, we can move the plan on the right off the table. We can find some other plans under 200 if you think. If she says, you know what, I don't care about first dollar coverage, I just wanna buy the cheapest plan, we can say, okay, well, that's the cheapest plan, is that the one you'd like? But maybe she says, well, I, I'm thinking about that, but this other plan that's more expensive, what, you know, what do you think about the first dollar coverage, is it worth it? And you can say, well, if you happen to go to the doctor a few times a year, that might mean more savings uh, compared to the more you're paying per month. So it might be different. And in the course of asking uh, or prompting those questions and helping them think through it, 
hopefully she can go ahead and find out which plan best meets her priorities. So let's summarize the kind of priorities she has. Walking in, want the cheap plan as possible. Many consumers are like that. Well, does she want to prioritize having a manageable deductible or having some manageable co-pays? And then how important is it for her to have some first dollar coverage and how much can she afford in getting these other benefits? Every consumer is different, but hopefully in that process, she's able to buy the plan that best for her. So now let's move on to our second uh, example. This is a married couple from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my hometown region, that makes $24,000 a year. And so in the process of talking to them about their health needs, maybe they mentioned that the husband has diabetes and takes a particular med medication for it called metformin. And maybe they mentioned also that he gets frequent lab work and so wants to know how that's covered by these plans. And maybe, you know, we also discussed the fact that some plans have chronic disease management programs and that could be something that's interesting for him. And they also mentioned that his wife has an OBGYN and she'd really like to be, uh, continue seeing her because she has a great relationship with her. So let's go ahead on to healthcare.gov and let's change this to their circumstance. So once again, we'll put in the zip code and choose their county. In this case, now it's two people and they're married and let's say they don't have any dependents. So now we'll put in their ages. And once we do that, we're gonna put in their income of $24,000 a year. And so now it says that they possibly or probably qualify for a tax credit of about $806 per month. And it says down below, it looks like they get extra savings if they pick a silver plan. And that's basically code for a cost sharing reduction plan. And when we created this example, we actually structured it so that the income was in fact below 150%. So they probably qualify for those very generous 94% silver plans. But now let's go ahead and see the plans that are available to them on the marketplace. Now, the first thing you'll notice, because their tax credit's so big, these bronze plans are very cheap, under $2. Uh, but as you can see, these deductibles are very large. And so before we dive into that, we actually might want to look at their providers, because they mentioned they have providers. So we can click up in the top right-hand corner, and we can go ahead and type in their provider names. And so we can go ahead and find that provider, and then we'll also look at their prescription drugs. Now, when we're looking at prescription drugs, we will need to know the dosage and what kind of uh, formulation it's in. So hopefully they can bring that information or even suggest in advance that they bring their vials in, their prescription vials. And in this case, we see it's this particular Advair formulation. So now we'll bring up the plans. And now, as you can see here in the bottom right-hand corner, it'll mention whether or not the provider's in network or uh, the um, drug is covered. Now, we do know that they... Uh, qualify for CSR, so we may want to go look at one of these silver plans, but maybe they say, you know what, we want to look at cheap plans. Now these first two plans don't have the doctor in network, and they also have huge deductibles. This next plan is a, much, is a little more expensive. Uh, it's the silver plan, and it actually has first dollar coverage, and it has the, uh, uh, the drug covered. Now if we want, we can actually go look at um, how this plan might cover them, because they also mention lab work. So let's scroll down and see how labs are covered. In this case, labs are covered at $10 with no worry about the deductible. It's exempt from the deductible. Now, they did mention prescription drugs and that it's covered, but we want to know how it's covered. So let's click on the prescription drug here, and let's go ahead and click on list of covered drugs. Now, here's a plan that actually allows you to look it up online. And so we're looking at 2019. We're going to type in the drug's name. And it's the tablet. And so now it says here, it is covered at tier one. And so we can go back and look at what the tier one payment is, $2, no worry about deductible. So that's something we can include in their search. So let's go back to the plans and let's include this one in our uh, search plan. So now we can scroll down and look for some other plans. The next plan here is a $79 plan from UPMC. It has no deductible. It also doesn't have the doctor and network and it does cover Advair. And when I looked up, it also covers it at tier one. Now, this wouldn't require them if they considered these two plans to change doctors for Sonia. And so one of the things, though, is we can actually look and see, um, is Sonia covered or not? So why don't we actually do that? We'll go here and we'll look up access to doctors and hospitals, provider directory. And so here it asks you, what are you looking for? We're looking for a provider. It asks for the last name. And now let's hit search. And now it shows you that while these things come up, it actually doesn't show her on the list. 
uh, it doesn't show Sonia Añeja. And so that means, in fact, the doctor isn't in network. So that's confirmed. I will admit that this search function on healthcare.gov has had a lot of different errors. And so it is unfortunately something we're going to have to go to the insurance company's website to double check, because otherwise it might suggest the doctor's in network when they're not, or say the doctor's not in network when they are. But let's go ahead and include this one in the search because it does seem like it has low copays, it covers the labs well. Now we can go down and we can see, are there any other plans that has the doctor in network and it also has low deductible? So let's scroll down and we can see here on the list that all of these plans uh, don't have the doctor in network until we get to this one that has uh, a huge deductible and the doctor in network. But maybe that's not one they wanna consider. So let's keep going down and here we see another plan, again, a big deductible, because this is the bronze plans. And so we can keep scrolling down. And in fact, we have to scroll all the way down to this plan here that has a low deductible CSR plan of $200 um, and it has the doctor in network. So it does look like it has nothing exempt from the deductible, but the deductible is quite low. And so when we talk to them, maybe they're okay with that because they know after one visit or so, they'll have met the deductible and then they just pay 10%. So we'll go head up and we'll compare these plans. And once again, we have this page here, but we'll hop on over to our slides to look at the three plans in there. So now you can see you have the three different plans. They're all server plans. One that's $65 that has a deductible of 350, but it looks like it really only applies to hospital stays. Everything else is exempt, but doesn't include the provider. The next one's a little more expensive, has no deductible, but actually has some slightly higher copays and also doesn't cover the doctor. Um, and if they want to include the doctor and have a CSR plan, they'd have to pay much higher, $472. And it still has a deductible of $200 and then 10% coinsurance. Now, once again, we can talk to them about their priorities. And if they say that they really um, need to value the doctor in network, we might have to look at this plan or see if there's another bronze plan that has them in network. If they say that she's okay switching because that's just too expensive, and if that's the case, then maybe one of these two plans on the left is more, is, meets their needs better. And so we can talk to them through that. And once again, we can look at the different priorities they have. So is the doctor in network and how much are they willing to pay more to get the doctor in network? If they have prescription drugs, is it covered? And then how is it covered? What's the cost? And then what's the best plan that meets their health conditions? So in this case, he was worried about labs. Other people might be worried about x-rays. Other people might say that they go to the ER a lot. And so they might be worried about that or how, how much does it cost for urgent care? And once again, through the course of talking to them about this, hopefully we can help them identify their balance, their priorities, and they can go ahead and enroll in the plan that best meets their needs. So now let's go to our last example, which is a, a, a couple of a family of three from uh, Orlando, Florida. They make $36,000 a year. And let's say as we talk to them, they mention that their daughter has asthma and sees a particular provider for her asthma and also takes an inhaler that they fill a couple times each year called Advair. And maybe they mentioned that the husband is actually considering getting this surgical procedure that he's been putting off for his knee and just hasn't done it in a while. And when he asked around, some friends mentioned that they got it done at this particular hospital called the Halifax Medical Center. So let's go ahead on the healthcare.gov once again and let us look up their situation. So we'll once again, go ahead and put in their zip code and we'll build information for their household. And in this case, we'll say that they do have a dependent. And now we'll go ahead and put the ages for each one. And it'll let us put in their income of $36,000 a year. And we see that they might qualify for a pretty big tax credit of almost $1,200 a month. It also once again says that they look like they get extra savings, which again means they probably qualify for CSR plans in the silver level. In this case, the income structure we used was around 160% of federal poverty level, which means they qualify for that middle range, that 87% version of CSR. So let's go ahead once again and look at the plans. And you can see right away, they qualify for free bronze plans. And as you can imagine, consumers really love the concept of free. These have huge deductibles, but before we walk through that, we might mention, actually, can we look up your providers real quick? So let's go ahead and look up their providers. and we can find one. Let's go ahead and look up the, the hospital system. Now, when you look up hospitals, they often list the different kinds of, uh, they might list the ER, they might list pharmacy. There also might be another one that's listed very similar in another city. So you can see on the top right, there's one from North Carolina. We want the bottom left one, the one that's there, that's closer to them in uh, near Orlando. 
And then they have a prescription drug. And once again, you need to know the dosage. In this case, we have 0.5 milligram. And let's once again, look at the plans. So now we can see here in the bottom, whether the doctor's in network, whether the hospital's in network, is the drug covered? Um, in this case, they do qualify for free bronze plans. Now we might mention, well, you qualify for some special silver plans. Do you want to go look at them? And some consumers might say, no, I'm, these are free plans. Let's talk about this. And you might say, okay, let's talk about this. We might come back to the silver plans. So maybe we're looking through the bronze plans. And one thing we might do here is let's say, here's a lot of bronze plans that have uh, free, uh, free uh, premiums, but have huge deductibles. And let's see, are there ones that maybe have some first dollar coverage? Are there any that cover their doctors? So the first one does have some first dollar coverage, doesn't cover the hospital. The second one has, again, first dollar coverage, doesn't cover the hospital. You can see here in Ambetter, this plan actually does cover the hospital, but only has generics as first dollar coverage. The next plan also has both hospitals, or both providers, but also doesn't have any first dollar coverage, and in fact, looks like it's one of those deductible only plans. And we keep going and we can see some other plans that again have, uh, might have the hospital, might not have the hospital. Now maybe in this process, the first one we saw, it didn't have the hospital. And maybe he's saying, okay, I'm open to shop around and see where I can go, but it does have that first dollar coverage. We like that. And in fact, when I look up Advair, it was covered in tier two. However, it was very confusing because it, was, it ended up having a six tier plan. And when I looked it up, I tried to figure out what does that tier two mean? Is it a $35 copay or a 40% copay? It was unclear. Uh, but so that, that might happen when you're looking up some of this stuff, but let's go ahead and compare this. Now let's say, okay, we can look at other bronze, but why don't we just go quickly look over to the silver? And so we can go ahead and do that. So now we see the cheapest silver pan is a much bigger price jump. It's $144. It has a pretty decent sized deductible still, $1,500. It does have both providers, but it looks like after you meet the deductible, 10%. And it does cover Advair uh, as well. We see another plan, it's $159, has an even higher uh, deductible, but looks like it has some first dollar coverage. And then there's an even more expensive one that has no deductible. Now maybe this is one they're really interested in because it has no deductible whatsoever and it has relatively low copays, covers the drug at $30 a month. So they might include this, but they might wonder, well, how much would we have to spend to find one that has a low deductible, has you know, lots of first dollar coverage and has the doctor in network? And so we can scroll down and the next plan we see also has no deductible. And here we go, has both providers in network, has very low copays. Now it says the drug is not covered. That's actually not correct. I looked it up, it is covered at tier two. Once again, this data is not always accurate. So let's go ahead and compare this. So now we have three plans and let's hop on over to our slide deck to look at how they compare. So have that cheap bronze plan that's free, has a very big deductible, but a couple things that are exempt from the deductible. Then we have the middle plan that's a lot more expensive, but no deductible. Neither of these have the hospital and network though. So then you hop on over to the more expensive plan, also has no deductible and cheaper copays, but also has the hospital and network. So we might talk to them about this. And again, try to figure out well, what really is most important to you. Is having the hospital network or not having the hospital network? Can you afford these prices? And maybe they mentioned, you know what? I'm curious to see if, what this hospital is because also this one has very low copays. And so they want to compare these two plans. And here we have that example I mentioned before, cheap bronze plan, high deductible, less first dollar coverage, silver plan, no deductible. And in this case also has their provider and network. And so how will they balance this trade off? And so one of the things we can do is say, well, let's calculate how you might fare under both plans. So you need to talk to them and say, well, how much care do you think you're going to use? How many times did you go to the doctor last year? Or how many times do you think you might go to the doctor this year? How many times do you take your daughter to her pulmonologist? How many times do you fill a prescription? And then he mentioned that surgery. So we might say, well, what kind of surgery is it? We might find out it's some kind of knee ligament surgery. And you can Google what's the average cost of that surgery in your county. Now, these values will be very approximate, but this is a, a way you can try to figure this out. So easy calculation. The annual cost of the plan is zero because the premium is zero. And it has some first dollar coverage. So actually, the doctor visits are going to be not as expensive as it would be if they were not covered, uh, if you had to put, pay the full cost. The prescriptions though, because the deductible applies, you do have to pay that cost. Same with that hospitalization. And so that ends up being $6,600 a year that they would spend if they bought this plan. And on the other side, the premium is much more expensive. So they're spending over $2,500 just in premium. But because they're no deductible and these copays are pretty low, 
This is how much they're paying for the doctor visits and for the prescriptions. And then lastly, the doctor visits 40% of the total bill, so $2,000 instead of $5,000. Uh, and so actually that ends up being $4,700. Now that's not cheap by any means, but certainly they'd be saving money by paying for the one on the right. And that's a concept important to help them understand. Now it could be different if their healthcare utilization is very different. If they have another major health crisis, it could be different. If they end up not getting the surgery, it could flip. But trying to really dive into them, trying to predict what they might need is a helpful way for them to figure out what might be worth it in terms of buying a plan. So now we add some new uh, uh, um, priorities, including if there's providers covered, which ones to prioritize. And then also this notion of estimating what is it gonna cost you in total for each plan based on your needs that you think you might do. Once again, every consumer is gonna be different and hopefully in this process, we're able to help them navigate and find the plan that best meets their needs. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Kyle to see if we have any additional questions. All right, thank you, Dave. If anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to type those into the Q&A box at this time. And we do already have one question here, Dave. So if someone estimates that they will be under 200% of the federal poverty line with their income, and they'll have a, say, $1,000 deductible due to a cost sharing reduction, if at the end of the year they end up with more income than they estimated, what happens to the deductible for that plan? So I would actually defer to my colleagues there at the center, but if I'm not mistaken, you're held harmless by the plan you have. If you were uh, enrolled in a CSR plan. It doesn't go back and change your plan, but Kyle, actually, that might be one we take to some of your colleagues. Um, and one other question here, is there a process for assisting consumers in setting up an HSA account if they enroll in an HSA plan? So this has come up before, and from what I understand, we actually are not tax experts. We're not financial experts. We are highly discouraged, if not prevented, from giving them advice when it comes to setting up an HSA account. And in my seven years, six years of doing this, I've never met a consumer that's had one. Um, I've heard of some through my peer networks of people who enroll here in the DC area who buy an HSA account and set one up, but they're of course much higher income who don't qualify for tax credits. So again, an HSA account might be okay for a consumer, but most of the consumers we work with, especially if they have any health needs, it tends to be one that doesn't provide the most value. And so are ones to, um, perhaps caution them on because they may look at them and see the prices, but um, we might want to say um, there might be other options that are better for them. And I, and I do want to mention, I didn't mention this before, one of the whole points of our job, as I always say, is to help explain to a consumer that there is a benefit of paying more for a plan. Because any consumer can buy a plan on their own based on price. They just look it up and the one on top is the cheapest one. They can click on it. Even an eight-year-old can do that. But our job is to help them realize, well, actually paying more per month is might get you better things that you want for your health needs. It might have your provider and network. It might cover more. It might have more first dollar coverage. It might be cheaper at the end of the year in total. So that's one of our main jobs. We're explaining to people to pay more because in the end that might be better for them. And so this HSA one is one example where uh, they could spend less money per month, but it may not be the best value for them. But as I mentioned before, it's really not our place to help them or advise them on HSAs. And I have yet to meet a consumer, especially, you know, the lower income consumers we meet where the HSA model really works for them because they don't have money to put in that pre-tax account. And one final question, could you uh, remind us what first dollar coverage is? Sure. So first dollar coverage is when the plan, it'll have a deductible, but it'll say that that deductible, you don't have to worry about it for a particular type of service. So whether that's primary care or specialty care or generic drugs, those are the most common services that a plan might choose to exempt from the deductible. That's especially in the bronze range. So as soon as you pay your first dollar in premium, it's uh, the insurance company is giving you some benefits. Uh, a plan that has no first dollar coverage, the insurance company doesn't pay for anything until you meet that deductible. Um, so for, like I said, for bronze, it's those three services that are often exempt if anything's exempt. Uh, one, two, or three of those. If it's a silver plan, maybe they also exempt some other things like the tier two level of drugs. Um, some also exempt um, everything except hospitalizations. So that first dollar coverage just means while, that, while there's that dis deductible, you don't have to worry about it as much for some of the services that you might care about. All right, and I think that's all the time we have for questions. I'll turn it back over to Dave. I know you've got one final part of this presentation. Yep, thank you, Kyle. So I just wanted to strongly um, ask you all if you wouldn't mind doing a very quick evaluation of this presentation 
And I promise you it will literally take 10 seconds. And that's the URL on there if you wouldn't mind typing it down or writing it down. Um, I'll run through the questions very briefly. Um, the first one is the question I asked before. You know, on a scale of one to 10, how, did, how confident were you in your ability before you started the presentation? Hopefully you have that number written down in front of you. And so now I wanna ask, how do you feel now after the presentation? Uh, and my goal, of course, is to try to improve it. If you were already confident, hopefully it moved you up. If you weren't confident, hopefully it gave you some confidence and skills. Uh, in addition, there's three quick questions that just ask, were there any topics that weren't in the slide deck that you think I should add because they're important? Were there any topics in the presentation that you think weren't that useful or aren't that relevant anymore and should be removed? And then were there any topics in the presentation that weren't explained very well? And I need to really make sure that we spend more time and focus on it. And again, you can type that URL in the bottom if you wouldn't mind going right now while it's fresh. It'll take 10 seconds. Two last questions. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the content of the training as very useful or not that useful? And then same thing, how would you rate the quality of the delivery of the training, one to 10? Um, uh, I really encourage it because that feedback helps me enormously in improving this, not just from year to year, but even from week to week as I go and do these trainings for different state networks of navigators. And with that, I just want to wish you good luck. Um, I know the past couple of years have been very tough in helping people in own coverage. I know that this year will probably continue the challenge or be even more difficult. And I just want to say that I think what you all are doing as navigators is one of the best, most meaningful professions in our country helping someone who can't understand how to find access to coverage eventually get coverage is one of the best things I think we all can do. And I just thank you for your service over the years and wish the best for you this coming year and, uh, and beyond. So thank you again. I'm going to turn it back over to Kyle to close us out. All right. Thank you for today's presentation, Dave. Um, as a reminder, we will be distributing the materials from today's session via an email, and we will post everything to the Beyond the Basics website. That website, again, is www.healthreformbeyondthebasics.org. The next part of this webinar series covering immigrant eligibility for healthcare coverage programs is scheduled for next Tuesday, October the 22nd. That's at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And on your screen right now, you can see all three final parts of our webinar series. Those are all, again, on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. You can register for upcoming webinars on the Beyond the Basics website under Upcoming Webinars. You can also find additional resources on the website, including reference charts, guides, and frequently asked questions. And when we send these slides around, that registration link for webinars will work for you there. If you have any other questions or need any assistance, please email our Beyond the Basics contact email. That email is beyondthebasics at cbpp.org. And with that, we will bring today's webinar to, to a close. Thank you, thank you everyone for joining us today.